Hello, welcome to another Election Bite, our series of short conversations about key election issues. I'm Soya Ellison. I'm an Associate Director of Communications here at the Carter Center. And with me today is someone who you are used to seeing as an interviewer, not as the interviewee, but she is actually also a democracy expert. This is Avery Davis Roberts. She's an Associate Director in our democracy program. She's been co-leading our U.S. election effort, and she's done a lot of work on international election observation standards. She's also a member of the National Task Force on Election Crises. Uh, that's all a mouthful about Avery, and I could talk about her even more, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let her take it away. But first, I'm gonna, I've got a question for you, Avery. Uh, and that question is about the history of the secret ballot. I was doing a little bit of research in preparation for our conversation, and I learned that Ballots were not always secret in the U.S. In fact, like parties used to print them on different colored papers. Anyway, can you talk a little bit about that history? Yeah, of course. Sorry. It's really great to be here on sort of this side of the camera. Um, but you're quite right. We have not always had the secret ballot in the United States. Parties did in the late 19th century sort of pre-print ballots for their supporters. Um, they would be pre-filled out and people would just sort of tear those slips of paper out of the newspaper or be handed those papers uh, by party operatives and cast those ballots. Before that, um, even earlier in American history, we voted by voice. Um, some people, you know, in some places, they would fill out a paper ballot, but it was definitely not secret. The election process was very public. Um, you know, when I was also doing a little bit of re research and reading just to refresh my memory, you know, there was a lot, there were lots of descriptions of these elections as being sort of chaotic and rowdy and raucous and very sort of public events. And there was this thought that, you know, voting in public and having your vote be known was an important way of holding people accountable. But this all changed in about, um, 1888, uh, between the, uh, aftermath of the Harris and Cleveland election. Grover Cleveland had been president. Uh, Benjamin Harris was running, Harrison was running against him, um, but Harrison wasn't really, you know, doing that well. He needed Indiana and New York to be able to get the electoral college votes to become president. Um, and so he did what um, many party candidates did at the time. He bought votes. He bought a lot of votes in New York. Um, he was a Republican. In New York, he worked with Democratic sort of party bosses to buy votes, to use intimidation, money, whatever means necessary to get the votes in New York. And in Indiana, he did the same thing. They bought a lot of votes. Um, and this was discovered because the person who was in charge of this effort for him wrote the instructions down for how to buy these votes on um, party stationery. And this was discovered. There was a big scandal. And yet he still won the election. Um, Cleveland would go on to run again uh, in the next election. And, but in the meantime, he did a lot of work to try and promote ballot reform. Um, in 1888, 1889, Louisville, Kentucky, and Massachusetts became the first two jurisdictions to use what is known as the Australian ballot, so a secret ballot, essentially. And by 1890, almost all of the states were using the Australian ballot. Um, the Australian ballot is called that because it was first used in Australia, um, but it sort of has four characteristics. Um, one is that the election is sort of held um, in public, but you can vote secretly or have a private um, voting process or individual voting experience. Uh, so your ballot is cast secretly. Importantly, those ballots are printed by the state. So kind of getting to your point, Soya, about pre-printed ballots, Australian ballot means that it's printed by the election authorities and that it has... Um, all of the election candidates listed there so you can make a free choice plus space for write-in. So it really is the ballot that we've come to recognize as, as our own ballots now. That is so interesting. And I think in a way, by talking to us about how that election went with Harrison and Cleveland, you've sort of answered my next question. But uh, my question is, now I believe this is a core principle of democracy, right? The secrecy of the ballot. Why is that? Why is it important that a ballot be secret? Well, I think there's, you know, a lot of, of reasons sort of going back to the Harrison Cleveland election. Obviously, there was a lot of vote buying, voter intimidation, coercion. Secrecy of the ballot is one way to sort of counteract these um, potentially really negative forces in an election process. 
Um, but I think another important point about secrecy of the ballot is that it's an equalizer, right? If you are voting in public, there's this, you know, there was that idea that I mentioned that it's sort of voting in public would hold people accountable. But that also assumes that there is complete equality between people who are voting. And, you know, in, in our early history, when it was just white property men who were voting, maybe that was the case. But as the franchise has grown and we now all can vote, I think, you know, there's been a definite recognition that even though we are all equal as human beings, we don't always have the same power. Uh, there's not equality of power until you get to the ballot box, until you're able to cast your ballot secretly. And that secrecy is really what empowers the potentially disempowered. Um, so it is a core principle of our democracy. Um, and it's a core international principle. It's a human rights principle that has been um, uh, codified in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and then, and subsequent international human rights treaties. So it's a principle that is um, uh, definitely foundational to democracy and is a cornerstone um, of global democracy promotion. Okay, well, let's get to today now. Uh, and let's talk about something that you just sort of touched on too, which is the idea of power. Because sometimes we hear these rumors or stories where an employer or a landlord or some other powerful figure has told people who they are above that they have a way of telling who they voted for, that they can see who they voted for. Is there any truth to that? Is that possible? It is not possible. Your ballot is completely secret. You know, obviously those sorts of threats, we, we hear about those threats a, a lot. Um, stories about, as you're saying, employers or landlords and you know, studies have been done on um, the number of employers um, that have put out maybe messages that are meant to influence the way their employees vote. Um, but at the end of the day, with a secret ballot, all of those messages that you may get from a landlord or from an employer are really just sort of empty threats because the power is with you. You can cast your ballot however you like um, in, in the voting booth as long as it's, it's a secret ballot. Okay, good to know. But I wonder now about hackers because we hear sometimes about somebody hacking the voting machines and knowing who we voted for that way. Is that possible? You know, I don't, to be honest, I don't really know why a hacker would want to know who we voted for. Um, you know, it's different in situations like you were describing with a landlord or an employee where there's like a clear relationship, but like a, a hacker, I don't know why they'd want to, but regardless, um, you know, I suppose they could potentially, you know, in, interfere in the election system, but they'd have to interfere in many aspects. You know, when you go in to vote, there is the sort of the poll pad in Georgia um, and in other states too, that includes all of the information that is specific to the voters. And that is separate from how you cast your actual ballot. So that separation is an important security um, as far as separating you and your information from how you cast your ballot. Um, and there are other uh, safeguards that are in place uh, to protect secrecy of the ballot. So while I suppose, you know, a hacker could do that, it, they'd have to um, sort of influence or interfere with many different aspects of the electoral system. Um, and, you know, it's just, I, I think it's highly, highly unlikely that that would ever happen. Okay. So this is my last topic. I won't say last question because it's kind of a two-part question. But um, I want to talk about absentee ballot. So if I'm voting absentee, how is my secret ballot protected if I do that? And also, we, we've been hearing a lot lately about signatures, ballot signatures, how, how we can check them later. You know, how does secrecy of the ballot relate to this idea of checking signatures? Yeah, that's, those are two good questions. So with absentee ballots, you know, one of the main ways that you can protect the secrecy of the ballot um, is that you, you do it secretly. So even though you are um, casting your ballot in a space that is not public, it is not regulated in the same way that a polling place is, you can still and can and should still take steps to make sure that you um, are casting that ballot secretly, that you feel safe in the environment when where you're casting your ballot. And I say that because in some circumstances, you know, you may be casting um, a ballot, but some people aren't always in super safe situations in their own homes. Um, you know, some, for example, people who maybe are um, targets of domestic violence, maybe in a situation where they don't feel safe. So in those circumstances, you know, it's really important that you do what you can to protect yourself um, and do that by ensuring the secrecy of the ballot as you're casting your actual ballot. Um, when, after you've casted your ballot, though, your, your secrecy is protected in that there are two envelopes that come with your absentee ballot. The outer envelope, which is the envelope that you sign, 
and then an inner envelope, which is called like the secrecy, the secrecy envelope, which is the envelope that you actually put the ballot into. So you put the ballot into the secrecy envelope, seal that, and then put that secrecy envelope into the outer envelope. And th that two envelope system is really there to protect secrecy because when the election officials receive your absentee ballot, they'll look at that signature that's on the envelope and compare it to the signature records that they have on file in the voter registration system. And then they separate that outer envelope from that inner secrecy envelope that has your ballot. So as soon as that separation occurs, there's no way to link you to your ballot. And this, I think, is a really important point, uh, particularly in, around these conversations of signature verification, is that, you know, we, while an audit or some sort of review of signatures against the voter registration system is possible, whether it's necessary is a different question. It is possible. There's no way now to connect those envelopes to those ballots that have already been cast. So essentially, there's there's nothing to do here that would sort of alleviate some of the the or address some of the concerns that have been voiced around um, wanting to um, review the ballots and the signatures together. They're kind of two separate processes, and for a good reason, right? To keep for a good to keep our ballots. Reason. Secret. Exactly. And in Georgia, it's a it's, you know, a constitutional right of Georgian citizens uh, to have secret ballot. I think 44 states um, guarantee secrecy of the ballot in their constitutions and the others uh, guarantee secrecy of the ballot through statutory provisions. So in every state, um, either constitutionally or statutorily, we have the right to secrecy of the ballot. And so to, to do anything else would be to violate those constitutional rights that we have. Got it. Well, thank you, Avery. This has been so helpful and interesting. I've enjoyed chatting with you. Um, thanks to you all for joining us. We'll be back here tomorrow. And tomorrow we're going to talk about what we're calling the final countdown. Some of the key dates that are still to come, uh, something called the safe harbor deadline, and specifically about the electoral college and some of the key dates and processes involved with the electoral college. So we hope you'll join us. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.